the key to success, uh, sustained success over a long period of time for anything is adaptation. Um, and it goes mm. for a business. It goes for if you watch, you know, a television show or a musician, they're evolving, you know, and if they, it's, it's evolve or die. So um, with us, uh, basically, we're constantly honing in on what people uh, in the virtual reality marketplace want, what kind of gameplay uh, they're looking for. The same game that came out two years ago is not going to be successful today, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it has to kind of constantly change and adapt. Um, and then there's new market opportunities that are constantly becoming available, mm. right? So that's that's part of that evolve or die process. If you get complacent and you make assumptions and say, oh, well, what we did in the past will allow us to have success in the future, that's when you're on thin ice, basically. Mm. Your commitment to quality and to orienting your company around more than just like segmented projects, but really being a long-term thing is, is a great part of your culture. And I'd love to hear how, how you've come to that and how you're still working through that. There's always decisions to be made. Yeah, I mean, we, um, you know, we see, we see the company as kind of like an artist, um, and our set of titles as like our our uh, oeuvre, I guess, right? Mm. Um, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, and basically, uh, you know, it's kind of just like any big artist coming out with an album. You know, they don't want to be like, oh, I'll just shove this album out now, right. and then and then get on to the next one. Like we don't think of it like that at all. You know, every re- release is basically uh, its own really important uh, project to the company. That's why each game, when each game comes out. They're all pretty wildly different. That's what kind of people know us for is the high quality and how different they are because we want to break new paradigms and do something that's new and unique because it keeps us interested, honestly. If we don't do that, um, you know, it's kind of like, what's the point? We we consider ourselves to be artists. So, um, you know, pushing the title back allows us to really make it that snowflake that that it should be relative to everything else that we do. Yeah. And having tried your games, too, now that you now that you pointed out, I mean, even the physical experience of being in a game like Electronauts, where it's very rhythmic, to uh, Raw Data, where I'm shooting and moving, or Rocky, where I'm working up a sweat. A very, very different experience every time. I wonder, how did you get into this VR business for people who don't know you? Yeah, so it's a, it's a fairly uh, long and in-depth and, and fascinating story. Um, so I uh, am a, um, I mentioned before, I went to Ithaca College for uh, t- uh, television and radio, and then I switched into computer science to make video games a little more interesting, and ended up working software engineering at an interactive television company in New Jersey, but I really wanted to make games, and so I started making a, a game on the side, um, started blogging about it, actually, blogging about mm. this little mobile baseball game that I was making, and um, learned a lot about Cocos 2D, which is an iPhone game development framework, and uh, this blog got noticed by a, a publisher uh, called Pact Publishing, and they publish game development books. And at that time, this is about uh, 2010, um, I uh, had never thought about writing a book before. Uh, the longest paper I'd ever written in school was 12 pages long. Um, I got an A minus on it, uh, and it was, you know, I thought I did a pretty good job, right? Yep. It was, you know, a pretty difficult paper. So now I'm like, hey, do you want to write like, you know, a 500 page book about game development, right? You know, send us a, uh, an outline. And so I sent them an outline, they liked it. I uh, ended up getting a publishing deal, and um, kind of uh, that summer, um, I uh, started writing that book. And it was actually a lot easier than I thought it was going to be, because I had developed all this information about game development over a long period of time, everything from you know playing Street Fighter when you're five years old to making an iPhone game and everything kind of in between. I could really pour into this book, because I'm really right. passionate about games. And around that same time, I applied to um, a bunch of uh, schools on the West Coast because I always, yeah, I'm from Philadelphia, but I always wanted to move to Los Angeles. Um, I always felt this kind of pull, you know, to the West Coast, like a lot of people do. And um, I got accepted to um, the uh, MFA and Interactive Media Program at USC. And so I um, quit my job, was writing the book on the road uh, with my my girlfriend, now wife at the time, and we drove across the country and um, started at USC at this amazing interactive media program, kind of the, the best, really the best in the world, honestly, for, for video games. I was very lucky to go there. And I ended up getting a job at um, a research lab as well to help pay my bills, honestly. Um, uh, it was uh, the um, Institute for Creative Technologies is a research, the research wing of USC, and then a little kind of like researchy wing of that is the Mixed Reality Lab, kind of like a little skunk works lab. And so they hired me to do some research for the US Army. Um, and uh, I ended up working with Palmer Lucky, and this is Palmer Lucky before he founded Oculus. And so I got introduced to virtual reality there and learned a lot about new technology and all those kinds of things. I also met James Eiliff, uh, who was also around the lab helping with the project there and then a number of other things. And um, basically, uh, the three of us uh, hit it off fairly well, um, James and I in particular, and uh, we got together and we wanted to do something for the advanced games track, which basically is like the big kind of, you know, 
a class at USC that simulates what it's like to be in the game industry. So my second year of a three-year program, James and I started a uh, project called Project Holodeck, which was basically a um, uh, attempt to take a lot of the virtual reality hardware that we had seen at the lab and really make it very simple, kind of um, make it so that you could set up two people in virtual reality wirelessly with full body tracking um, in like 20 minutes and get them in a game. Yeah. This is very kind of, uh, you know, uh, ambitious project for a, a two punk kid students <laughs> like us. And, um, and Palmer was very much a punk kid at that time. He's probably like 19. Um, and so, uh, you know, Palmer helped us out by uh, developing an early headset for it, and we had all these different pieces. Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, we took Project Holodeck, right, which was a research project uh, at USC and a, and a games project, and we uh, basically said, we'll roll the IP of that um, into a, uh, first it was an LLC, actually. First we had Holodeck uh, Interactive LLC, and uh, basically, you know, we were looking for our initial uh, kind of investors, and so I put together, you know, a whole business plan and pitch deck and, and all sorts of these things, and I never had done that before. I think I went to, there was a website that I used to help me develop a business plan and everything. Mm -hmm. I forget what it was called, but maybe, maybe it was live plan, um, but it w worked out pretty well. And uh, we were looking for investors and um, our, uh, we had this great um, uh, composer who does uh, the com uh, compositions for a lot of our, our, our uh, titles um, still to this day, uh, Jeremy Tisser. And uh, Jeremy was just, uh, you know, hugely into what we were doing, could see that VR was going to be the future. Yeah. Um, and so he had, uh, you know, his um, his father and his uncle actually were um, both uh, interested in, in er being early investors. Um, you're talking about writing checks of, you know, 100 grand maybe or 150 grand if you're a... Um, uh, you know, a professional, uh, you know, his uh, father was an entertainment lawyer. And so mm -hmm. uh, he likes to make small investments like this, you know, around the city with, you know, potentially a kind of new technologies coming yeah. out. And so uh, them together with a few other people made up our kind of angel uh, round, uh, so to speak, or actually our, more like our seed round. And so they invested uh, invested in the company. We ended up incorporating as Servios. Uh, Servios was a name that James and I kind of made up uh, after you know looking at um, working with a branding agency and looking at a list of names. And we were able to get the domain for it. It's only seven letters, and it has kind of a cool name. Yeah. I don't know if I've, I've mentioned the name, what what it means. Um, Let's go. Yeah, yeah. So Servios is um, Sir is uh, over or beyond mm -hmm. in. Um, in Latin, like yeah. like in French, yeah. uh, and then um, Vios is um, uh, life, uh, you know, like like biology ah. in, in ancient Greek. So yeah. it kind of means um, you know ov over life or beyond reality, mm -hmm. right? Two different languages, right? Um, so that combined with the fact that it sounds kind of cool, and we have the domain, um, you know, it was like, all right, this sounds this is a cool. Let, let's do it, right? We're well. making something. This is alchemy, right? We're making something out of nothing. Yeah. Um, and so uh, basically, you know, we started the corporation and start working on. Uh, you know, kind of the next gen of this prototype that we have. We ended up making kind of a small backpack um, unit that you could that you could wear, and we made a new game called Zombies on the Holodeck. This is in 2014, and this is probably probably the best virtual reality experience in the world at the time, just because we had gotten a leg up on everyone, and it was a single player experience, um, but it was incredibly terrifying. And um, it was built on more of like a mobile a mobile chip. Um, so we used to have a laptop on your back. Now we had this like small little thing. And um, we actually were working with Oculus at the time. They'd given us an early version of one of their headsets to work with, mm -hmm. built our own tracking system. And um, with this, um, basically what happened is we built this really great demo. And we had um, a staff of about, excuse me, about six or seven people. And so uh, with that, we basically, when we had about, you know, three or four months of runway left, James and I were like, okay, got to go raise some money. <laughs> it's it's, yeah. it's time, right? Because yeah. it's not really, this is a prototype. It wasn't really a business at that point. Uh, you know, we're still, once again, punk kids, not really 100% sure what we're doing, but, you know, we had we had felt a little bit of that magic and we wanted to keep yeah. it going. And so um, we basically packed up the prototype that we had and um, I, uh, I had to make some quick decisions at this point. So I ended up um, looking for a short-term apartment or house uh, rental in San Francisco that I basically rented sight unseen. And I had to rent something that I had enough space for James and I to sleep in, had to be nice, nice enough to show investors, and also had enough space to run this demo. Mm -hmm. And I had to do it without, I didn't, I didn't have enough money or time to fly up there and investigate and actually check places out. So I ended up going to this random website and renting this thing. It was like four grand a month or something and just kind of being like, like screw it, let's just go for it. So we end up up there and um, basically James and I would camp out up there. Every day we're um, meeting people, demoing the products, um, uh, 
editing our pitch decks and modifying our pitch decks over and over and over again, meeting with advisors, um, and basically trying to immerse ourselves in Silicon Valley as much as we possibly can. Every night we're going to cocktail parties right. and meeting other people right. and basically trying to work our way through networks, right? You know, how, how do you get to, um, you know, the way I describe it is, uh, you know, how do you, if, if you want to get to Mark Andreessen or something, right, how do you get to him? First, you have to find three people that he knows and trusts, right? Then you have to get to, you basically have to get to those three people and they have to tell him that they, that he should see what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So how do you get to those three people? Well, for each one of those people, you want to find three people that they <laughs> know and trust, right? Yeah. I call it triangulation. Um, and basically, we triangulated our way through a large network of potential investors. And, and even with a, when a VC would see what we were doing and not want to invest, they would still be really enthusiastic about it. And yeah. Because this is new tech that you can't just go and see, you can't just watch a video of it, you have to experience it firsthand. They basically had to say, look, I, I need to get some of my guys down here to see this, right? Mm-hmm. Because they're basically taking a look at the future. And so with that, we worked our way through a, a number of VC networks. And um, just to get technical for a second, are, yeah. you, are you going to LinkedIn or are you asking people, hey, do you have a phone number for this guy? Or how, how are you yeah. really getting to those people? So um, a lot of it starts with uh, looking for really good advisors. Uh, there's a number of advisors mm-hmm. out mm-hmm. there. Um, uh, no one I'll mention by name, but uh, if you just look for uh, venture capital advisors, and, and you know, a lot of people will take meetings, um, and okay. and you know you can get like you can um, cold email uh, people up in the space up there, and if you have a new, they, everyone wants to uh, the whole network of people up there, they want to make sure that they're not missing out on the latest deal, the yeah. latest new piece of technology. They're always constantly keeping their ear to the ground. So if you have something new or interesting or innovative that you can show someone or talk about, um, you know, they'll take a, take a meeting with you, have a cup of coffee, what have you, and then you kind of work your way from there. So um, you can cold call or uh, cold email VCs, but a lot of time you'll get um, – push down the ladder to their associates and kind of there's a lot of gatekeepers in a lot of those places. Sure. Um, I found that um, the advisors and people who run accelerators and things of that nature are actually a little bit easier to work with. And then you kind of work your way into some of those networks first and then they end up knowing a lot of the VCs. So you kind of, you don't, you almost go to someone who's VC adjacent, so to speak, mm. and try to work your way into a, a network that's kind of adjacent to their networks, and then you can kind of work your way in. But ultimately, it's just, it's networking at the end of the day, right? It's, it's um, you know, it's just like Hollywood, right? I mean, it's yeah. kind of, you have to be a little bit rough and a little bit aggressive and kind of find a way to steal five minutes of someone's time or, you know, that sort of thing, or track people down. I mean, I remember... Um, you know, uh, back when we were looking for, um, so back back when we were doing Project Holodeck, uh, to do- roll it back to that for a second, we uh, one of the things you had to do, you know, USC really makes you hustle and makes you learn mm-hmm. how to hustle in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. Uh, we had to find um, uh, artists for our project. And you're, you're basically going around town trying to get people to work on your thing for free, right? Right. So that's the definition of hustling right there, <laughs> if you can do it. And one of them is that, you know, there's a number of art schools out there. There's Otis mm-hmm. and there's, um, you know, um, uh, Art Center in Pasadena, a lot of great 3D artists, Nomen. Nomen's a fantastic video game art school. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, we were trying to figure out how do we get students from these schools to work on our project as like a research project or like a school project, you know, for free, basically. Um, and maybe they can do for class credit, maybe, maybe they can't. Um, and one of the, the tacks that we, we took was, let's go ahead and try to contact the teachers. Well, you look on their website and, you know, you, the teacher's name might be on there, but they definitely don't give you any contact information. Uh-huh. They're not trying to, you know, put teachers on blast or whatever. So, uh, you know, we found a way um, to reverse engineer email addresses. I mean, email addresses <laughs> follow some basic principles, sure. right? Um, and so, you know, I think this is a reasonable request to see if some teachers want to work on a project like this. It's done pretty commonly. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, when schools work together uh, across schools for different projects. The art school provides artists, you know, for the, the project. The engineering school provides engineers everybody works on something together and then everybody has a portfolio piece when they're done so it's not yeah. like we're doing something nefarious necessarily but we have to work our way into these networks so i remember uh, i reverse engineered uh nomen teacher email addresses mm-hmm. and um through, through various mechanisms and i think i emailed like 15 professors one got back to me right that professor um had a class with a bunch of 3d artists which we presented to and then we had about 10 artists from that class nice. to real, doing 3D models and concept art and all these things for Wild Skies, which was the two-player game that Project Holodeck uh, demonstrated, mm-hmm. right? So that allowed us to actually build out the art side of the project, but it was entirely through hustling. So we had a little bit of that experience of working our way into networks, <laughs> you know, by hook or by crook, so to speak. And when we got up to Silicon Valley, it was a similar process, and we kind of honed our ability to do that a little bit there. Yeah. Did you have any 
any stories like that up there too? Like, were you were you bumping into Ben Horwitz's dog walker at the dog park oh, or something? Man. You know, honestly, um, it, it's a bit of a blur at this point. Um, when we were up there, um, and a lot of it involved uh, some advisors that we had, which were really good, who kind of gave us insight as to which VCs we could contact and, and who we should kind of talk to. It was, I would say, it was actually a little bit easier for us to work our way into the VC network. Oh, really? More structure? Uh, well, it was more like um, some of the advisors we had were, were, were good enough that they would recommend certain kind of names of people, and they, you know, they trusted what we were doing enough that, mm-hmm. you know, it, it was cool enough that pretty much anyone had to see it, right. whereas the artists at Otis, like, we wanted something from them. With the VCs, it's more like, have you guys seen virtual reality yet? Well, you have to see this because it'll blow your mind. So right. we actually picked up a decent amount of traction fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, and your product yeah. is so exciting. Like, the first first time Alex invited me to, to come to the offices and to, and to try out virtual reality games at the offices where they're made, I was there that night. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's so enticing. Yeah, we had, um, and we would have a meeting with a VC. Uh, the key was meeting with someone who's a decision maker because you don't want to get, you don't want to hit a wall of like middle management or mm-hmm. something. That's like a really important thing. Mm-hmm. And basically, uh, you know, we would have meetings where someone would see it and they would say, you know, I'm going to call the rest of my office and they're going to come today. Mm. To, they're going to, you know, they, if they have time over lunch, they're literally all going to come down and check it out as well. Wow. Um, so that happened a few times. And the way things ended up going down for us is we had some really great uh, VCs, kind of tier one VCs scheduled. And um, around the same time, I remember I was at the Intel office because we we're all talking to the big tech companies and there's like Intel Capital, they all have their funds, right? So we're really talking to virtually everyone. I'm at this office and I, I hear that... Um, Oculus gets acquired by Facebook, right. right? This happens while we're pitching, right? Right. So basically, you know, I don't know if any what everyone thinks of the of the VR industry at that time. It's not even an industry; it kind of is barely an industry. And we're showing them this this mind blowing prototype. But beyond that, there's not too much else. Now all of a sudden, Facebook gets acqui- or Facebook acquires Oculus for three billion dollars, and there's just an incredible amount of <laughs> blood in the water. Right. right. They're like, wait a minute, they acquired them. And so they all they start sniffing around to see what other companies are there out there that are similar to Oculus. Well, we're coming from the same lab that Palmer's coming from, right? right? right. So we're exactly at the right time, at the right place. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, they say, uh, uh, I forget what the, the quote is, but it's um, success is where opportunity meets preparation, mm. right? I mean, this is exactly mm. w- what this was. So you know, a few days later, we had our our top. Um, uh, investor who we were targeting, and then another investor literally come in and um, rub elbows with each other when they like walked past each other because they were their meetings were lined up side by side. Uh, which uh, just to throw out kind of random little bits of information, um, when you're trying to raise money, you always want to generate uh, deal heat, is what it's called, mm. right? One person in a vacuum is not going to invest in you. It doesn't really matter how how good what you're doing is. If, um, if there's no competition and there's no um, kind of like scarcity, I guess, right. then they're not going to kind of pull the trigger. So how, uh, it was just a stroke of luck on our part, the way we had scheduled things, that these two investors walk past each other and they kind of look at each other and like, you know about this? You know about this? <laughs> and so immediately yeah. that, that, that heat is starting to be generated, right? It's like, like starting a fire, you know, you have to create some friction. Uh, and so, um, yeah, basically we found a great tier one investor. We had a friend of great follow on investors and the rest of it was honestly pretty easy at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, we had another advisor of ours who helped helped um, explain a lot of the details of of how we need to do the deal side of it, right? Because mm. once you get to that point where you're trying to paper a deal, once again, we're these two punk kids, we have to make sure we get a really good lawyer. We ended up right. with a, a great lawyer right. from, from Cooley up there, which is a w- well-known law firm that helps make this process easy when you're raising money. Um, and uh, we read um, Raising Venture Capital for the Something Entrepreneur, um, I forget what it's called, by Dermot Berkeley. Great okay. book that'll explain all the details of, of how these deals go down and things you should watch out for and that sort of thing. So Cool. I'll uh, put a link to that in the show notes if yeah, anyone's interested. Yeah, definitely. Um, for the serious investor, I think is what it's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically, um, at that point, uh, we were off to the races. We ended up raising... Uh, so you have your lead investor, right? Um, and then you have follow-on investors. The lead investor is by far the most important one mm. uh, because it really is a herd mentality in Silicon Valley. So uh, once you lock down a lead, um, the rest of it is pretty easy to fill out, but you want to get the best lead that you possibly can. And really, overall, just a recommendation, you want to get someone that you can trust. Uh, that's yeah. that's by far... And, and an institution that you can trust as well because they're that one person is operating on behalf of the institution if they... Uh, go away. The, you know, the, they, someone else will represent their their money, and it could be someone who has a completely different agenda. So it's important to understand that. Um, but we found a great lead. 
um, uh, in a Rob Coney beer of Shasta um, as our Series A lead, and then we had follow-on investors after that, and uh, ended up raising four point two million two million dollars. Uh, brought that back down to LA, and uh, then it was like, okay, you know, uh, we have to let's go ahead and do this. Now this is back when you know Oculus got acquired and. They were making just a headset, and there were there was no one else making like consumer VR hardware at the time. Mm. So our original premise was twofold. It was we're going to develop amazing VR games and content because we'd shown that we can do that at a very high level, um, and then we're also going to develop VR hardware um, because we had been developing our own hardware at the time. Right. So um, over the course of the next year, we ended up developing a um, uh, something that's very ahead of its time and it, no one has really taken a look at because it's not really public, but I can talk about it a little bit. It was a um, virtual reality video game console uh, and it was very much wow. me being the kind of head of research and the, the you know, I was CEO of course, but um, you know, running the company, but I was also like the primary hardware person. Um, it's kind of like my baby. It was like um, if Apple made a virtual reality PlayStation is kind of yeah. what we were kind of going for. Yeah. Um, and so we had this really slick game console, and then we had these wireless um, controllers and a, uh, a first at the time, a wireless head-mounted display. And it was all um, with uh, a very powerful graphics processor and, and central processor on the system. We had built our own operating system, which is a modified version of Linux. Uh, and then we had um, basically everything working together so you could be uh, you know, fully, like basically you turn on the box, or you, you press the button to turn it on, you take everything out and put it on, and then you're just in virtual reality, and you're good to go. So there's no setup. It's kind of the simplicity of what Oculus does today with the Oculus Quest, but with the power of um, a uh, really powerful PC, but you're mm -hmm. also wireless. You're not tethered to it. Wow. And this is back in um, 2015 when we had developed this. Yeah. So, uh, it's, so it's 2015, and you have this vision of being the Apple of VR exactly. at this point. And like, how are you? How are you picking these models? Because as as you're navigating this path, you're always stepping into uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. So how, how are you making these connections and, and developing this vision? Yeah, I mean, I think um, James and I at that point were, we were drinking the Silicon Valley Kool-Aid pretty heavily. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, I, I remember reading Steve Jobs' biography and just kind of like really getting a sense for um, a product ethos, uh, which really we really just derived from Apple, honestly, mm -hmm. um, with regard to uh, building a all-in-one full-stack solution. Yeah. Uh, we thought it was an audacious vision, um, and with an audacious vision, uh, you can you can raise a lot of money. You know, um, when you're in Silicon Valley, uh, people want to um, they, they want to invest in something that could be huge because they're looking for a big return. Mm -hmm. And with us, you know, we could try to make one little small thing that maybe plugs into someone else's you know system or whatever mm -hmm. but um we up until that time we had already always developed our prototypes in this holistic manner mm -hmm. um you know we'd always develop them with you know we're going to make the controllers we're going to make the tracking system the headset um, a lot of it was with off-the-shelf parts but over time we would swap out the off-the-shelf parts with our own systems so we'd made our own tracking system now with this new one we had a, a more in-depth tracking system we had uh, custom optics that we had developed. Um, you know, uh, we had our own controllers with their own kind of wireless system that we had developed. And it was, um, you know, we had to do the whole, all the plastic molding and, and making a video game controller is very hard. No one ever really talks about it, but mm. making something that has, um, this, this one, it's, it's, it's really cool. It basically had, um, I guess we have the video. So it basically, you could, uh, you could wear it on your hand and it would go across your hand like this. And it was like a, uh, like a pistol grip. Um, and then if you, uh, because it had, it's strapped to your hand right here, mm -hmm. you could let go and it, you wouldn't drop it. So you don't have to, uh. so it's basically like, um, you know, it's more like grabbing an object. Like right now, even with like the Oculus touch controllers, if you just let go, they fall. This one right. was still in your hand if you let go. So it felt a little more like, like grabbing an object properly. Mm -hmm. um, and it had some, some really, you know, innovative and kind of, uh, unique designs that are still, you know, I think the industry is still catching up with a little bit today. Yeah. Um, and stuff like that is extremely complex. Like I used to do human factors in the military and like the, the stuff that goes into something people put their hands on mm -hmm. is a huge project unto itself. It's a big statistical project. Yeah. And you have to, um, 
you know, you have to account for that and know that something is going to work within one to two standard deviations of a, a general kind of population and right. kind of know who you're targeting. Uh, the original Xbox controllers are the classic example of they're just giants, right? Yeah, they're just like who did what, you know what, what, what was the size of the hands of the guys of the guy, the guy right. developing this, right? So um, or there's uh, you know what is it? Um, the classic one is like some sensing technology not being able to sense like black people, right? Mm. Like it's developed by a white guy and mm. basically someone tries to go wash their hands and they can't or you know issues with Microsoft Connect I think or similar technologies yeah. because they need to be tested on everyone and when you're talking about you know size of people's bodies or light reflecting or even some cultural things like we would have mechanics in a game that people of like one culture would get intuitively because they just you know like like pumping a shotgun uh, mm-hmm. to be the zombie game right and the people of another culture who the shotguns is not a common thing and they're just like they just you know you're putting them in this crazy virtual reality thing and trying to teach them how to use something that they don't they don't even really have much of a conception of right and they're just not going to get it so right. um, a lot of those uh, statistical human factors really have to be taken into account when developing any kind of new technology or new interface, anything that's kind of like fundamentally innovative. Um, and uh, so with us, we had to take a lot of those things into account and kind of, uh, you know, set ourselves up for success by just kind of shooting in the middle and making sure that the system worked well enough with other people. Uh, IPD is another one, right? A lot of headsets have IPD adjustment. That's the, the um, distance between oh, yeah. your eyes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so someone with a very narrow IPD can have eye strain. Someone with a very wide IPD can have eye strain. Um, you know, there's all, all those kinds of little human factors have to be taken into account. So um, what... so we developed this prototype and it really was um, a kick-ass prototype, but it was, um, you know, it was very difficult for us to build up our skill set in the areas that we needed to, to really develop it, manufacture it, and mm-hmm. bring it to full production. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that time, uh, some other hardware had started to come out and we realized, like, who are we competing with? Well, Valve and Sony and honestly, these multi-billion dollar companies and, um, you know, uh, it was, uh, it, it was a little bit, um, uh, difficult for us to actually be able to compete. So what we ended up doing, um, at a certain point is we pivoted to being a game studio mm-hmm. because we had developed all the game studio technology in conjunction with developing the hardware. Mm-hmm. So we put the hardware aside and said, we're going to go ahead and focus on building the best possible, you know, high quality VR games that we could. Yeah. And that's where the shift from the prototype games that uh, came uh, to the games that we started to release. And that was in early 2016, um, we announced Raw Data as our, right. our first title, which really we, you know, always shooting high. We're like, okay, well, if we're not going to be the Apple of VR, let's be the, the Bungie of VR, right? Let's build the Halo of VR. The Halo, right? yeah. yeah. And so that's what Raw Data was always designed yeah. to be, was the Halo of VR. It was, uh, because we had been working on a zombie game for a while there, and we realized that it was very, it was very one note. You know, you can only mm-hmm. you can play this one note really well, but you can only like uh, this one kind of like emotional note or this tone, right? Um, and with with um, raw data, we could play a number of different tones. It mm-hmm. could be uh, sci-fi and cyberpunk. It could be uh, you know, it, it could be horror. Uh, it could be kind of heroic. It could be a number of different things. Mm-hmm. So we started developing that. Um, the HTC Vive came out in April of 2016, mm-hmm. uh, and we launched in June of 2016. And I remember uh, when we launched, it was immediately. I think we sold like. 25,000 copies or something on the first day. Like it was just the, the first day wow. launch was just, you know, for such a small, literally there's barely, these things barely exist. Right. And all of a sudden, literally everyone who had that headset basically was buying the game mm-hmm. because it was the highest quality game to come out at the time. And, uh, you know, it absolutely blew people away. And it, it put us on the map in the, in the gaming space mm-hmm. to say, okay, these guys, you know, really mean business. And it was an early access title. It only had four of the levels out um, of the 10 that we ended up developing. And we ended up developing this, uh, you know, entire world and all these missions and kind of the rest is is history, so to speak. Um, But that really put us on the map. And at that time, that was when we said, okay, this this game studio thing is really going to work. Um, we ended up moving into the space that we're in now, which is like a big seventeen thousand square foot hangar, right. um, and that's where we, uh, you know, we found some of the the great talented executive and and, and management staff that we mm-hmm. have today, mm-hmm. and really kind of started um, laying the foundation to grow into the company that everyone knows today. Right, and at, at twenty sixteen too, is that sort of when your personal brand, Alex and Graham, you guys are, are becoming more known, Forbes 30 under 30 is happening. For people who are thinking of maybe, you know, founding a startup, I think we lionize the CEOs and and there's a lot to the publicity around who the CEO is as well. Is that all happening at this time? Uh, Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's happening uh, pretty consistently. 
Um, and we, you know, it's, it's, it's a very good thing for the company when those things happen. So Mm -hmm. we have, you know, it's been, um, my prerogative and really, uh, you know, James Iliff, um, our co-founder and chief creative officer, he's, um, He's a PR genius. Is the best mm. way I can describe yeah. it. Yeah, and um, it's really something that he he takes very seriously. And so, any time that myself or him or anyone else at the company can be, um, you know, given uh, a big platform uh, to speak to people, mm-hmm. you know, we do that and we push that. And mm-hmm. we basically have a PR firm that we're working with uh, constantly. So oh, wow. uh, it's very much part of our mission to uh, to kind of get in front of that. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, if we're going to, if lionizing the CEO means we sell more games, then that's, right. what, then that's what we right. do. And being the CEO, uh, you know, uh, at, at the time, it's, um, you know, I don't mind it either, right? It's good. It's yeah. good. It's good for me personally, yeah. and it's kind of what, what what's good for me is, is good for the company and vice versa. Totally, totally. So, as we're navigating this story, you you describe yourself as a generalist, and that is now so apparent. You can see all the skill sets that went into doing all this. How do you navigate all the skills, all the things that you're trying to learn, and then keep the high level vision and keep leading the charge and and watching out for people and keeping to all of that. Yeah, it's difficult. Honestly, it's uh, it's it's a lot to be able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm the kind of person who likes to dabble and likes to tinker and likes to have a good working understanding of a large number of things. And it helps in the game industry because a video game contains everything else, right? It contains yeah. art and technology, yeah. and just audio. I mean, literally everything you can imagine can be inside of a video game. Uh, and then usually, uh, from my perspective. Uh, you know, it was, my goal, step one was to raise money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then step two was to hire the most talented people that I could possibly find. Mm-hmm. And uh, what you're trying to do is, you know, take your little bit of, as a generalist, I'm kind of like a hyper generalist, you take your little bit of knowledge that you have, you put it in um, kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a format that allows you to then hire people who have as much knowledge in that domain as you possibly can. So it's mm-hmm. like I'm a, you know, I'm a decent enough engineer. I know enough about engineering. I kind of understand. I mean, I understand the high end of it pretty well. But I'll, let me give an example. Um, I under I understood what went into really great optics design, but mm-hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean that I can design optics mm-hmm. um, like super well myself. Mm-hmm. I designed the optics on our headset that we had built, but it was partially a trial and error process of seeing what optics, I, I literally went through you know 50 different lens varieties that I had with, with specific glass and specific coatings because I was looking for something. Um, when you're actually de- designing the optics themselves, what you're doing is you're really hiring an optics designer and you're creating a specification for them to design to. You're not actually doing the work yourself. So you wanna have enough information to be able to identify who the top talent is in the field and then, um, you know, talk them into joining you, basically. Mm. That, that's really what you want to mm. do. And if you can do that in multiple fields, now you have a company. Um, and uh, as a generalist, that's really, uh, really, really what you're trying to go after. Yeah. So you, you, balance, you balance that against your ability to keep to the vision. And we've talked a little bit about how you, you've tried to build the company a lot on some ideals from things like the way that Pixar set up the physical space mm-hmm. and also avoiding a, a setup that's going to like burn people out or just kind of use them up. How do you do that? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there, there's a number of different, um, you know, kind of uh, philosophies that we've tried to, um, you know, imbue into the company. Um, so there's how the space itself is designed, mm-hmm. um, which has always been of paramount concern with me. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, uh, you know, if you read, um, I think it's in Creativity Inc., uh, excuse me, or it might have been in the um, it might have been in the Steve Jobs biography. Uh, basically, when they were designing the Pixar offices, they wanted to maximize the ability for people to bump into each other and mm-hmm. for people across the business to just have offhand conversations. Mm-hmm. And uh, the idea is that would spur on creativity, and it would also allow people to. Um, communicate at a high level and it, you wouldn't kind of like breed mistrust with the different departments, right? Because everyone would be kind of constantly communicating and collaborating. Um, so there's actually, there's that. And then there's also, um, I do have a belief that people should go out drinking consistently, um, which I haven't <laughs> talked about, but uh, honestly, it's where a lot of times people talk about things that they can't normally talk about. Sure. Uh, this is a very common thing in Japanese culture. Uh, it's talked about with, um, I think, some ancient Germanic cultures. It's kind of a common thing in, in human culture in general where people just need to be able to um, to be to be real with each other for a moment, right? Yeah. And Definitely military culture. Military culture. Okay, good. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a pretty common kind of standard thing in any large, well-functioning organization to have some of those outlets. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, we would... Uh, 
made sure that, um, you know, we'd have regular times where people are going out and kind of having fun together and building those bonds. Mm -hmm. Um, we would also, a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, take someone out for drinks. If we're, you know, there's someone we might potentially hire, we kind of want to see like, how are they in more of a social situation? Is this someone that we actually want to get along with? Because we realized we were, um, we are building more than just a company. Uh, really my philosophy was, um, so, okay. So to bring it all back to like, a, a central philosophy that I kind of had in trying to build the the business is, um, you know, I uh, just personally don't have as much family as I'd like. I'm an only child. Mm-hmm. I have, you know, uh, some aunts, aunts and uncles, and but generally my family's kind of spread out across the country. Parents got divorced when I was 12. Mm-hmm. Um, so personally, I don't have, you know, the the community that I want. When I got out of college, I had, you know, friends from high school and, you know, I had a little bit of a community, but I could see it starting to break down as people have to focus on, you know, their spouse and their immediate family and their job. There really isn't room for this kind of the community that I always wanted, right? Where you kind of get up and you you have a big family and you say hi to your friends and you're mm. kind of like, you always, you know what I'm saying? That kind of just yeah. like, it, it, that tribal living that everyone really wants. Yeah. And so um, what I saw was an opportunity to build that using the corporation as the model. Uh, it's, you know, it's not the, the best thing, right? Because you're still there to make money is still a corporation, but it's kind of like making lemonade with lemons in, <laughs> in, in 21st century society. Yeah. Um, so with me personally, um, I was trying to build a community at Servios. Um, if you, uh, and what I always like to point to is the song, uh, lean on me by Bill Withers, oh, you know, yeah. lean on me when you're not strong. Right. So that song is, is really fascinating. Um, he, uh, came from the South to Los Angeles and, um, I forget exactly where, but, uh, basically where he, um, grew up had, uh, much more kind of community culture and community values. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, people would, would take care of each other. He moves out to LA and people basically don't do that. He doesn't have a community, and he, ha- he has to forge his own community here, mm-hmm. just like so many people do. Mm-hmm. And that song is literally, it's basically him trying to explain to someone in Los Angeles what community is. It's like, look, if you lean mm. on me when, when I'm not strong, you know, I'll, or, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, let you, uh, I'll lean on you, whatever, right? There's, there's that kind of like um, uh, back and forth that he's trying to kind of explain. And so um, with me coming out to L.A., uh, you know, I wanted to build a community where I had, you know, uh, I could go on adventures and have best friends and some right. amazing experience. And, and, you know, I wanted to, um, uh, I don't know, just have those like that. I, di- I didn't want to uh, be alone. I saw that my parents had, you know, maybe one or two close friends by the time they're like 45 or 50. And they really, mm-hmm. it's more, everything's family centric. And, um, you know, I, I was uh, determined to, to change that. And so Servios um, was constructed as a, you know, to do that basically. So everyone forging those close bonds was really a- about creating that ultimately at the end, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and building a, a business was, uh, you know, probably a little bit to my detriment, incidental to that goal mm-hmm. uh, ultimately, because ultimately they're human goals more so than business goals. Mm. They're the ones that I kind of go after. Mm. Um, so everything points in that direction. So yeah. not, not to get into it too much, but that's kind of the the fundamental motivation of a lot of the choices that are made. So ultimately, you know, you hire people that you want to hang out with, that you want to be around. Mm. Um, you invest in people. You know, we had uh, when we switched over from uh, doing hardware, we had to lay off uh, most of our hardware team. But some of the people on the hardware team, we didn't lay off because they um, had skills that we thought we could reinvest in and actually um, they could migrate to being in the game studio. Uh, and uh, that actually worked out really well for us. So wow. those family values are really mu- very much baked into the company and baked into the culture. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, and to this idea of connecting with people too, you, you describe yourself as when you start this out, you guys are a bunch of punk kids, <laughs> but now you're leading hundreds of people. Do you have how do you, how do you find mentors? What are you doing to connect with other people to to learn and get that that kind of high level leadership stuff rubbed off on you? You know, it's hard. Honestly, it's very very hard. It's hard mm-hmm. to find leadership advice. Um, there's not a lot of places. There are leadership uh, advisors that you literally can pay mm-hmm. uh, to come in right. and and kind of like counsel you on leadership. Um, yeah, there's 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 CEO coaches, mm-hmm. um, but it, it's you know, you have to pay for them and they're kind of, I don't know, you, you really need, you need other business people. Uh, you need peers, I would say yeah. is the most important thing. You need to kind of um, group up, group yourself up with other business owners. In the video game space, you should mm-hmm. be hanging out, you know, if you're the CEO of a game company, hang out with, you know, nine other CEOs of game companies and, and, and share notes with them, right? That, that's mm-hmm. probably the most important thing you can do um, mm-hmm. to really understand how that business works. Mm-hmm. On the leadership side, 
that's more, I don't know, that, that's, you glean that from a lot of little places and uh, there's not, I'm sure there's books about it, but yeah, that's something that I've just had to learn um, through trial and error and, and through reading about, you know, the leaders that I kind of aspire to be like. Mm-hmm. Right. So. And, and you practice what you preach. I remember when we were at the, the cookout at your house, like, talk to somebody else and they'd say, oh, I don't work for Servios. I, I run this company or I do, mm-hmm. I do this thing instead. How do, you, how do you find those people? How do you pick who to really invest in? Um, interesting. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I appreciate these prompts because they're, they're prompting me to remember certain kind of like little, little things that I've, I've learned. Oh, good. Uh, so one thing um, that, I, that I've, uh, if you, one thing that I'd say that's, that's if you can do this, um, you'll have a lot of success but it's, it's not easy. Mm. Um, it's not easy when you're smart too, actually, ironically. Find someone who, when they talk to you, you have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, man, yeah. if you can do that um, and, 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 and stick to that person mm-hmm. and try to, uh, try to understand what they're talking mm-hmm. about. And it's only happened to me like really truly a handful of times in my life, but every single time it's happened, um, it's been uh, you know a gold mine, I guess, for lack yeah, of a better word. On. Yeah, because these you know people like sometimes it'll be someone with business information or legal information or a lot of times technical information. But that's really how you how you learn something mm-hmm. and how you level up. I had this my my first well my first experience with, with it was in high school. I had friends that were just incredibly smart, much smarter than I was. I was you know they're all uh, PhD scientists now. Um, but you know when, when they would talk about something. I was on the, the the edge of understanding what they were talking mm. about, and that always intrigued me. Um, when I was uh, an engineer early on in my career, I had I would say a person who I would consider kind of my engineering mentor was this this guy that we hired, um, who um, this really kind of uh, absolutely drop dead brilliant engineer, one of the most brilliant engineers I've ever met. Yeah, and he had this like he almost was like a guy from like the movie Apollo 13, he was like a Southern kind of guy (laughs) with like this, like just brilliant kind of like Southern, Southern draw. He would talk about these incredibly complex things and he would, he would break down, um, you know, a complex like political issue, for example, into, into the economics that makes it run Mm. just like offhand in a conversation, just like it's nothing. Right. Mm. This guy was just absolutely brilliant. Um, and, uh, for the first two weeks I, I, um, worked with him, couldn't figure out what the hell he was saying. (laughs) Honestly, he was so talking at such a high level that, um, it was, it was, it was difficult for me, but eventually started working with them and became friends with them and, you know, could, could speak his language a little bit. And honestly, for someone who, you know, is going to start a business, raise money, um, kind of be involved in, in very complex spaces, you have to be able to speak that language. You have to be able to understand very complex concepts uh, and technical concepts. And so, um, I, I realized at that time that there really is a value to that. And mm-hmm. so kind of keep your ear out for, for people who are, are speaking a certain language, I guess, from a talent standpoint, um, that's really, uh, you know, how I've met a lot of the people that I really want to collaborate with over the years. It's just, um, it's kind of, um, Jimmy Iovine talks about this in The Defiant Ones. Uh, he talks about it with regard to Lady Gaga, uh, who mm. basically, he said, um, when, when she first started talking to me, I, I couldn't understand a word she was saying. She confused the hell out of me, so I, just, so I hired her. Um, and that's, that's really his philosophy with regard to talent, um, is the, is he wants someone who, uh, is going to come at him from an angle that he is not, does not expect. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I think that really works when you're talking about really high end talented, uh, technical people or scientific people. Right. So you are, you're bumping elbows with all these people. You're getting exposed to all these ideas. You said you've, you drank a lot of the Silicon Valley Kool-Aid. Probably a little too much. (laughs) Maybe too much. (laughs) How do you now know where to put your energy to keep your company on on the front edge of all the waves, because that I think you know part of your story is that you've been really timing a lot of things so well to come into this VR space at the right time. How do you keep hitting those waves and staying ahead of things? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, you know investing in our technical tools and infrastructure is very important. Mm-hmm. We've basically you know being led by our CTO Alex Silkin and uh, CTO and co-founder. We've been um, developing a tool set, which we then reinvest in consistently. And so every time we have a new project, we build a new technology, which then is part of our um, uh, palette, so to speak, when we then develop something new. So uh, Battle Wake, our game that came out recently, has incredible um, water technology and uh, vehicle technology, all that works over a network, um, which is very difficult and, and kind of non-trivial to develop. So that's now part of our toolbox 
uh, and we basically keep adding to the toolbox. And the next thing we develop is, um, you know, is just a lot better than what we devel have developed previously. And it's also a lot uh, more efficient. Um, so we have to maintain that, that efficiency to keep costs down and be able to actually build um, uh, uh, what we're doing in a, into a successful business. Um, we also, uh, you know, we learn and we change and we adapt. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. if uh, the key to success uh, sustained success over a long period of time for anything is adaptation. Um, and it goes mm. for a business. It goes for if you watch, you know, a television show or a musician, they're evolving, you know, and mm. if they, it's, it's evolve or die. So mm. um, with us, uh, basically, we're constantly honing in on what people uh, in the virtual reality marketplace want, what kind of gameplay uh, they're looking for. The same game that came out two years ago is not going to be successful today, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it has to kind of constantly change and adapt. Um, and then there's new market opportunities that are constantly becoming available. When we first started, we were, you know, um, being the kind of, you know, diehard uh artists and rebels that we were, we're like, we're never doing anything with any, anyone else's IP. It's just our IP. We're making up uh, our own stuff. You know, raw data is completely unique science fiction world. Still to, to this day, I think a brilliant science fiction world that, you know, you can make a movie out of that world. Um, and we, you know, that sprint vector electronauts. Um, but what we realized, uh, at a certain point is that, um, in this market, uh, IP has a decent amount of power mm -hmm. and value. And if we do it right, we can really do it well. And so that's when we developed Creed, Rise to Glory, mm -hmm. and um, with, uh, in conjunction with MGM. And, um, and it just blew up and was a fantastic title for us. And so mm -hmm. that was you know, a little piece of evolution that we, that we put in there. So we're constantly looking for ways to evolve. And you kind of have to um, keep it moving all the time. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I liked at the company when we would change offices I would say every year to year and a half because mm -hmm. I knew it broke things up. I knew it mm -hmm. kept things fresh. And now that we've been in the same office for a few years, we have to find other ways to keep it fresh because we don't have that tool in our toolbox to break things up again, mm. right? So that's, that's part of that evolve or die process. If you get complacent and you make assumptions and say, oh, well, what we did in the past will allow us to have success in the future, that's when you're on thin ice, basically. Mm. Wow. Well, Nathan, before I ask my last question, if people want to see what you're evolving into, what Servios is evolving into, where should they look for you online? Uh, so you can uh, check me out on Twitter. Uh, it's Nathan Burba. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you can also go to NathanBurba.com. And yeah, um, for Servios, uh, it's uh, Servios on Twitter, S-U-R-V-I-O-S. Mm -hmm. And uh, Servios, it's the uh, same thing, S-U-R-V-I-O-S.com. Awesome. We'll put links to that in the description for anybody who wants All to right. check it out. And Nathan, my final question is, what do you think a leader can do to develop their top talent? Well, I would say in terms of attracting top talent, top talent wants to work with top talent. So you want mm. to, um, you know, everyone wants to learn from someone. Um, and typically the most talented people that I know are just hungry to be able to learn and work and hone their craft. So you have to, you have to know that their motivation for being with you is um, not necessarily for the money that they're going to make mm. or the trying to build the business, um, those are great, but they're trying to invest in themselves and uh, build up their own talent. So you have to give them the tools to be able to do that and to progress. If they, if their development plateaus with you, then they'll they'll want to go do something else. Mm. So you have to really. Um, understand that you're, you know, you're in this together. Um, they're, they're exchanging their talent for the ability to get stronger and gain a better mastery over what they do by working with you. So that's why talented people will usually want to work on new, interesting, innovative problems. And they don't want to, you know, even if it's something that they can do and maybe they'll make a lot more money, if it doesn't interest them, then it's just not, not going to work. Yeah. That is tremendous advice to end on. I would say if anybody listening to this is thinking of becoming a startup founder, they should rewind, <laughs> listen through this again. That was huge, man. Thank you so much. My pleasure.